folks, I think we'll go ahead and get kicked off. Uh, thanks everybody for coming to the to the Bellwether League Healthcare Supply Chain Leadership Forum. Uh, we have two panels today. Uh, the first is what is the healthcare supply chain getting right, and the second uh, panel, which will start around 4:15, uh, will cover the payer provider convergence and how that will affect the supply chain. So um, we'll take a, a short break in between these two panels. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, our first panel for, for joining us today to talk about what the healthcare supply chain gets right, and I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly and hopefully accurately. Um, first, we have Karen Conway. She's the Vice President of Healthcare Values with GHX, and one of her main focus is really advancing objectives of value-based healthcare um, in the supply chain. So um, I'd like to thank her for, for joining us today. Next, we have uh, Joe Colonna. He is the Vice President of Piedmont Healthcare in the Atlanta area. He's, uh, his department was recently, recently recognized as the Supply Chain Department of the Year by Healthcare Purchasing News. That's a very high honor. And Joe, you're also here to uh, honor one of your teammates tonight, correct? Yes. Yes. Amy Chapa uh, has a future famer sitting over there. Okay. Awesome. More than, more than a little responsible for the award. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Joe. And then last but certainly not least uh, is Nick Geish. He is the CEO of Nick Geish & Associates. He is the chairman of the Bellwether League board and all around a good guy. So, so first of all, let's just thank the panel for coming here. They're going to be doing all the heavy lifting today. So. Okay. The other thing I'll say is I'm going to get away from the podium now because I want to make sure that the crowd feels free to interact. Um, this is uh, going to be recorded, so we'll be posting this on our Bellwether League Thought Leadership podcast um, after, after the event's over. So uh, if you have a question, just flag me down. I'll be happy to run out to you. We've also got a, a microphone right there. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the title of, of the first panel is What the Healthcare Supply Chain Gets Right. And that uh, particular title might be uh, intriguing to some of you. I think we spend an awful lot of time thinking about what we're not getting right in the healthcare supply chain. We think a lot about what our unique challenges are and things that we have to overcome. And I think that we don't often enough look back at everything that we've accomplished and what we actually do really, really well, and maybe even talk about some of our unique, uh, unique assets and uh, strengths in the, in the healthcare supply chain. So before we get into some of the, the, the meat of the panel, I'd just like to ask any of these folks, you know, this is a tough business. Anything can go wrong and usually does go wrong at least once a day. So what gets you up in the morning to do this really, really tough job? So I'll start with you, Karen. Well, as you said, you know, things can go wrong, but the thing is, is that when we do things right, we really make a difference. And I didn't start my, I started my career in healthcare, but I didn't start in the healthcare supply chain. I was working more on communications and actually working on mergers and acquisitions between healthcare systems a number of years ago. And, and to be honest, I never set out to be in the healthcare supply chain. But as I have um, worked in this area for about um, two decades now, I recognize that this is, there are just fundamental skill sets, fundamental capabilities within the supply chain that I believe are critical to us being able to achieve the objectives of value-based health care. And I think we can, we can extend these capabilities. We can, one, stand up and say, look, we can help in these particular areas. But I think we can also, we can help train, take some of those essential skills uh, that we have and be able to help those who are in finance, who are in the clinical side of things, who are doing IT, who are end-to-end -end in the healthcare supply chain, and help take those skill sets and bridge some gaps and make a difference. So what's the challenge that gets you kind of excited and in the interconnected, interconnectedness that we have with a lot of other departments? And, yep. Great. Joe? Yeah, so this will probably be the easiest question I ever get because um, I've, it's pretty simple for me. We, we take care of the people that take care of our patients. And uh, if you ever see me coming at you with a medical device, something's going horribly wrong with the <laughs> medical system. But our job is important because we make sure the people who are good with those devices have what they need when they need it. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of uh, is also making sure that the people who do that work see that it is, it is important. Uh, it's very easy day to day to do the job, be on the loading dock, work in the storeroom. Um, now with corporate offices, you may be in purchasing and never see a patient. You may, may be in an office um, far removed from all of that. And, mm -hmm. and the ability to make sure they understand that that is important. 
that, that what they do is important. I want people that are at five o'clock on a Friday that are walking out the door, the phone rings, they turn around, they come back in. Yeah. And that's the kind of people we have because they take real pride in it and they understand it. And when we did a recent uh, employee survey, uh, the comments from the frontline staff over and over and over again was, I know my job is important because I take care of the people who take care of the patients. Mm -hmm. And so that's what gets me up every morning. That's awesome. Yeah, well, it's going to be very similar to uh, things you heard from my two colleagues here. But first, I want to acknowledge Nate for, one, holding the session, and two, actually bringing a session up, talking about the positive things that we do uh, in our industry that we love every day. So thank you for actually bringing this to, to, to the forum. Hey, it was your idea, Dick, well, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's called mirroring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, you know, I've been privileged to work in this, in this industry for, for many, many years, and I think uh, very similar to what you've heard. I mean, there's four, three or four things that really kind of get me up every morning. One is, is really the passion to serve others. Uh, and I've been fortunate to, uh, and gifted to work with everybody, uh, not only in this room, but other colleagues, and I think that's their central purpose as well. In fact, we, we live in an industry where, unfortunately, for the majority of the, the activities that we have interactions with, and, uh, their lives are being changed dramatically. So the opportunity to serve others was really kind of my first centering point as well. And then I think it was it's just some inner drive to really make a significant impact, uh, mm -hmm. not only to the professionals that I have had a chance not to serve, but more importantly to the patients and the families uh, that were there to, to, to support as a whole. And then I think uh, the other two things that, uh, as I started to think through this, Nate, uh, one for me was to have a positive impact to the community that I live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really felt healthcare uh, allowed me the opportunity to do that. And there, there is a sense of pride in being able to kind of filter through your community and, and identify yourself with an organization that's serving others. Yeah. And that was the main driver for me. And I, I think to me the last point was, for, uh, for all of us I think in this room, was an opportunity to work with strong professionals in an interdisciplinary group mm -hmm. that allows each profession to rise to different levels, uh, which also pushed me, I think, uh, as far as some inner drive. So if I took a look at providing kind of a, a circle and dimension of where I came from and where I am today, I think that's really where my centering point has, was and really still is today. Yeah. A couple things that, uh, th there are some repeating themes in there that are really strong and important. And I think the multidisciplinary piece is, is really big, because you're right, it, it, it forces you to approach your job a little differently. And I mean, I sure know that if you're going to go talk to a doctor about anything, you better have <laughs> everything sorted out properly before you do that. But a couple things are, you know, tying what you do to, the, to your mission. And that doesn't just happen naturally, obviously. And, and really in the supply chain, you are some, you could easily be divorced from the day-to-day -day operation, especially when you're in a corporate office. So just a quick question for any of you who wants to take it. What are some ways that you could uh, make sure that that mission is connected and that, that we don't have that separation between what I do supporting a clinician, supporting patient care versus what, what the real downstream impact is of what I do? Well, I would think, I think it, it is incumbent upon us, um, you know, leaders in the supply chain to make sure that everybody who is working for us, who we're working for, who we're mm -hmm. working with, understands what we can bring mm -hmm. and also understands what are the challenges? What are we really trying to accomplish in healthcare? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are trying to move from a system that takes care of the sick to a system that keeps people healthy. Right. And this is a, this, I think most people know we're trying to go there, but it's very challenging. It always is in any kind of dramatic transition like this. So helping people understand where are we trying to go, mm -hmm. there will be difficulties as we take that one foot off of the dock and get into this sure. new canoe, et cetera. But understanding that and, and understanding then again the role that supply chain can play. Because mm -hmm. I look at it as um, any system anywhere in the world has a finite resources, and then we've got populations to take care of, mm -hmm. whether to keep them well or to take care of them when they're sick. And so understanding what is it that folks need, and this is a, a wide range from the social determinants of health to that implant mm -hmm. that might happen, and keep people understanding what we're trying to, the direction we're moving, and understanding kind of some of those nuances and those changes and those regulations and the different things that are, and just helping people keep moving through that, but keeping their eye on that, that higher goal we're trying to achieve. I, I think the maturation of the value analysis process, the, to mm. clinical value analysis. Let's be honest, those of us who've been around, and in this room a lot of us have been around, um, is 
value analysis when it was first formed was really get the nurses together to convince them to do the thing I want them to do, <laughs> right? And now it's maturing into let's listen to the nurses, the doctors, the other, the other end users, heck, engineers, whoever, the end user, and working together become a facilitator that gets to the right product at the right time. And that's the difference. That's getting us closer, has over time gotten us, got us closer to what's really happening at the bedside, what's really important, and formed a partnership. Instead of saying, well, we want to get you all to use this product because it's less expensive, it's can we all work together and figure out the best way to get this product, best way to use this product. Uh, I never would have dreamed of uh, 30 years ago or so when I started that now in a shop I'd have five nurses and a part-time doctor working part of, as part of our clinical resource team. I don't think it's our job anymore in sourcing to necessarily nego negotiate contracts. It's our job to facilitate the connections that drive to the best choice. Mm -hmm. So that, that evolution is, is something maybe I can, I can add to because I think a big part of uh, you know, allowing us to be relevant in what we do in supply chain is also being relevant in the eyes of the patient. So for mm -hmm. me, it's always uh, maintaining a patient-centered approach uh, with the team that I've always worked around. So the idea of shadowing uh, and the idea of uh, being a part of the integral aspects of what each team does at a unit level is so critical because, it, again, it provides that relevance of not only what we do from a supply chain perspective, more importantly, how we're impacting the lives of both the patients and the families that we're serving. So, so for me, it's, it's coming back to having that mindset as, as the number one focus. And from there, decisions, I think, are made at, at a much easier and a much more readily uh, 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 perspective. Yeah. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the focus that uh, I've always tried to maintain, uh, at least in, in the times that I've had a chance to work at, at, uh, at, at unit levels, but more importantly for the team that's worked around me and for me, is maintaining that focus uh, from a patient's perspective. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, you have to kind of do the hard work with the clinicians and with the end users to, to figure out what it ex exactly is about a particular product or a category that is, um, is tricky or is, is sensitive to them, and then building that credibility, right? And so um, I, I do think that maybe too often it's, it's easy just to say, hey, there's a lower cost item. Mm -hmm. I don't need to fully understand why we're going to make the move, and, and, then you, and then you pay the price for that. But uh, it's, it's getting in there and doing the hard work that um, not only makes for a better not only it makes for a, a better, well-adopted process, but it makes the supply chain obviously an awful lot better too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if I can add to that, Nate, I, you know, I think, you know, 20 years ago, it really was it was this battle between its cost or its quality, right. mm -hmm. and the two are not at all mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm really seeing is that it really does have to be that patient-centered right. outcome that has to lead it all. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and I know there's a number of people in the room who will agree with this, it's really about re understanding what really works for this particular patient or population of patients. And then it's about reducing variation from outside of mm -hmm. what works. Now, the thing is, we're not building cars. So we're not, it's not always the same brake system. Some patients do require this particular therapy, this set of products, et cetera, whereas other patients maybe at lower risk right. don't mm -hmm. yeah. need it. But it's understanding, and if we really are leading based on the evidence and what particular patients or populations need, mm -hmm. then you know what, and we're gonna reduce that variation, the cost will go down mm -hmm. and the quality will go up. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I know the second panel probably will get into some of those discussions, but if you take a look at the evolution of where we may be going as a healthcare ecosystem itself, now you start to talking about predicting and preventing, and more importantly, where are we going with the precision medicine aspect of, 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 our, of our activity? Supply chain is going to become a much more integral piece of understanding and recognizing really what that means mm -hmm. as relates to the technologies, the services, and the products that we're delivering as relates to the quality of life and what that may provide, say, in an extension of one year, two years, or three years down the road as far as the quality of what the individual will be receiving. So, you know, the, the thought process of where we are today and the complexity that's going to be on our shoulders for the next really five to eight years is only going to become uh, much more demanding. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, without maintaining that patient-centered approach, I think we could lose sight of, of what's important, and I, and, I, and I truly believe we will not, mm -hmm. but I also think it's, it's a vital component of who we are as it relates to uh, the DNA of a supply chain uh, expert. So, I mean, I, I could make the argument that maybe one of the unique assets within the healthcare supply chain is, is that patient-centered right. focus um, and maybe a little bit more collaboration than you might otherwise see in, in other industries. Can you guys think of some unique uh, characteristics or unique assets that the healthcare supply chain has relative to potentially other industries? I think we have to be more flexible. I think the, the comment earlier that we're 
we're not making cars is true, but we are making health care. So mm -hmm. we have, I think we need to adopt some methods and some ideologies and some ways of doing business that have always been sort of uh, thought of as negative, right? If you ever say we're going to treat getting patients well like manufacturing health care or manufacturing a car, it kind of freaks people out. But I think there's some fundamentals there that we need to start to embrace more so than we have in the past. I think that's why you're seeing some folks come outside of healthcare and be successful. They don't come with some of the same uh, handicaps. Having said that, I think we have to be more flexible. We have to understand that the idea of standardizing everybody to the single thing may not work. On the other hand, in talking to our chief medical officer, who's about process improvement and quality, I've ta we've had long conversations about if you really want to find out why all of your knees aren't out, coming out the same way or you're having issues, have every doctor do it the same way <laughs> and then figure out what the variation is. And if you do that, then you should be using the same implant. And if you do that, my job's mostly done, right? <laughs> and so that, I mean, because I, I can, I don't mean just on price. I mean, I, I know I can figure out easier how much I need to stock. I can think about forward buys. Mm -hmm. I can think about lots of things that other industries think about. And it's not because we necessarily want to lower the cost. Of course we do. But it's also about the quality. Start mm -hmm. focusing on the quality outcome, the consistency of doing it. And now we're, we're supporting that because ultimately that's all we are. We're we're not going to drive it. We're going to support it. We're going to be part of the conversation. But that's where the opportunity, I think, lies. And I think understanding, I think, you know, one of our challenges in the healthcare system is we have not treated it like a system. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of systems thinkers. And supply chain is absolutely a system and has to look at all of these different aspects. So I think that's a particular area that we can, we can help expose that mm -hmm. um, to others in healthcare. Well, maybe just to follow that line of thought, if you take a look at, uh, again, the healthcare ecosystem, at this point now we're following the continuum of care, right, you know, yeah. from really start to finish. So I think supply chain expertise really comes into play at much deeper levels with mm -hmm. that. And the beauty is, is I mean, we're, we're seeing that in the room today, we have a trusted society of professionals that has a willingness not only to share, but help advance and, and, and innovate at a local level, mm -hmm. and then more importantly, where that local level innovation can go at a national level. So we've got a trusted source of professionals here in this room and we'll meet you'll see later in the evening even a greater group that's going to allow that evolution to continue and not only be a supportive arm for that they're going to be in an advancing arm of, yeah. uh, of information yeah i mean i will say that in the last 10 years the, the major change i've seen is the availability of data and information systems and appreciating those systems and the ability to create material that we used to have to purchase from the outside and do yeah. it much quicker and so i think that we really have to grow to appreciate in a deep and meaningful way what the systems need to be set up and the way they need to be set up to deliver unto us the data we need to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And and the inter, I mean the integration of the EHRs and the ERP systems are so much more than they were so, yeah. so few years ago. And we should embrace that, not see it as a burden, not see it as a problem, but see it as an opportunity to drive some really deep, meaningful analytics about what's really going on in our organizations. Joe, I mean, just I'm going to ask you directly, just because you're, you know, we you represent a provider uh, on on the stage. But um, I know from from my past, and uh, if if we're managing our data properly in the supply chain, it does build some credibility and visibility within the organization, and uh, it helps you get get at the table when you otherwise wouldn't. And I think in some ways we have kind of a unique ability to do that, um, even even relative to some other functions like revenue cycle and, and mm -hmm. some other quality areas. So um, it's, again, simpler, a little less complex than some of the other data sets that we would otherwise, you know, uh, be dealing with internally. But uh, has your experience been that the better you manage your data um, within, within your realm, uh, the more access you had uh, within your organization? I think the more we've challenged the organization on what we want to deliver. Mm -hmm. So there's a... Um, um, Amy, who's being recognized later, she calls it my unicorn. I really mm -hmm. want to understand at a, a meaningful level what is it, what does it really cost to do every procedure, and mm -hmm. what are the tools you need to do those procedures, and what do you make on those procedures in a way that, say, a Ford understands how much they can sell a truck for, right. because and then they make decisions like, well, I can lower the cost because this component will be made here, this component will be made here, and yet again, we're going to put it together someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really uh, you can't know that unless you're getting information from the rev cycle piece from yep. the the uh, clinical outcomes piece from the lab piece from all of those pieces yeah. and it, t it takes a real commitment though on every one of those areas parts 
to truly keep that data the way it needs to be kept, to mm -hmm. honor it. And, and I think that's something that we're just now starting to really understand. Well, also to share it too, right? Because some of those disciplines don't necessarily want to share the data they have for a, for a sourcing event. <laughs> but I think the bottom line change that has to happen is are we creating systems to make our lives better or easier or somebody else's? Mm -hmm. So, so many of That's us as business partners, we create our own ERP systems to make our business easier, but we end up burdening the customer and make it harder for our, those systems to talk to each other. That happens within the four walls of a hospital too. Mm -hmm. the, the EMR folks create it one way, we create the ERP system a different way. We sort of talk to each other, but we didn't, weren't thinking about each other when we did it. Yep. I mean, um, Epic may be a great system. It doesn't care much about supply chain. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't build that as a supply chain tool. And they only deal with us because they have to. And, and that has to change, too. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of Oracle. Oracle didn't build their ERP system so that it could be work really well with an EMR system. Yeah. Those things have to change fundamentally. Yeah. It's very good. And I think it is a matter of, you know, um, you and I were talking earlier, and I do spend a lot of time, for example, on the adoption of GS1 standards. But, you know, it is more than, you know, I, I argue a lot about we need to call the same thing the same thing no matter what we're doing with the thing. Yeah. But it's also, it's not just a matter of having a global trade item number. It's also speaking to those other disciplines about how they format data, mm -hmm. why they format data this way. And as we move to value-based healthcare, it, it's the multiple um, multitude of benefits that we can get. And we have to keep, again, looking at what are we trying to accomplish. And then we can start looking at how to manage the data. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal recently about how much does a, uh, a, a total knee replacement. And, you know, it, it was easy because they were saying, do you know that hospitals don't actually know how much it costs them to deliver care? And, you know, it's really about getting people to understand that we've had this we do price-based costing. We mm -hmm. don't do cost-based pricing mm -hmm. in healthcare. And the value of being able to pull those data elements together to understand multiple things, not just how much does this procedure cost, but did it work and how does it work for these different populations. And then you start thinking about some of the other benefits. If we actually know what we're actually using, mm -hmm. we could actually create demand sensing in healthcare. And I mean, really do supply chain and bring that value. But it delivers multiple value, not just for supply chain. Yeah, I, mean, I obviously agree with my, my colleagues. I mean, I think the greater challenge, I mean, is, is data modeling becomes more much more sophisticated, and you're taking a look at decreasing the variation in how we're receiving data from various systems in, the, in the, uh, throughout our programs. I think we will solve those issues. I mean, mm -hmm. those will be solvable. But if you take a look at uh, where we want to go as it relates to high tech and high touch, you know, maintaining again that, that connection, I think, can't be lost in the translation. And that's my greatest concern if we start to move forward, because the innovations that are going to come down the line as it relates to technologies and the variations of practice that will be reduced based on the information that we're all gathering is going to be solvable uh, because we know we've got great minds around that. But if we lose sight of the high tech, high touch uh, uh, centering point, then I think we lose sight of where we want to be as, a, as, an, as an industry. So my concern is making sure that we balance that. Uh, and, and I'm really pleased to see the evolution because if we take a look at the supply chain executives that are here today and or maybe here tonight, you know, we have different skills and competencies that are being developed. So you have strategic thinkers, you have human-centered design, you have those competencies that now are incorporated into supply channel executives that may not have been in, in years past. Mm -hmm. But that's the evolution as far as the change that I'm seeing in the industry. That, that's a really a welcome change because it's incorporating what we're talking about as far as the technical and practical aspects of data management. We're also understanding that it requires a human element to still be successful long term with this and need to align the two uh, to really see a mature program. And I think that's the direction that I'm hoping to see our industry go as a whole. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we are moving in that direction and I'm pleased to be a part of it. I'm going to shift gears real quick, and this is actually a pretty, that was a good segue, Nick, almost like you were reading ahead a little bit. But, um, so there, there is a lot more talent coming into the pipeline for, from a supply chain leadership perspective and supply chain. So I don't know, um, you know, I, I, would, I would argue that there are more supply chain uh, programs in the undergraduate and graduate level uh, uh, colleges than there were definitely back when I was in college, and that wasn't that, that long ago, it was longer than I'd like. But, um, and within the last couple of weeks, I've had different conversations with folks from UT Dallas, which has a really good uh, supply chain program. One, one individual got his JD from SMU, which is a top, top law school in the country, got his uh, master's of supply chain from UTD, and he's talking to me about going into healthcare supply chain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, it's, it was great, but it's, if, if you were, but there's gonna be a lot more people coming out, um, out of college that specifically train in supply chain. It's a much more attractive profession than it might have been, you know, um, a couple, 
a while back. So if you were to make an elevator pitch to these new potential leaders coming out of their graduate programs and come into healthcare and apply, apply their talents in this healthcare supply chain, what would your elevator pitch be? Well, I actually had to write this one down because that was a, that was a grand challenge. So I'm thinking if I'm in an elevator and I have an individual that may be thinking about transitioning supply chain. So I'm going to read this so I don't forget it because it took me a while to, to see if I can be concise with this. I think I would say, I think it was four things. Be confident in who you are as a professional and the profession you have chosen. That would be the first thing I'd tell. Never lose sight of maintaining a patient-centered mindset because it will serve both as a directional and a moral compass on where you're going to go. Surround yourself with individuals and organizations that will stretch your thinking and your capabilities. Ground yourself in your career with a deep understanding and respect to the human condition in every and all interactions. Not only the influence it has on you, but the influence on others, because in the end, it will determine the leader you're going to become. Mm -hmm. So if I had 30 seconds to talk to somebody about the transition to where they are to where they're going, I would lead with that. It may sound trite, but I would st probably start with, I mean, if you really want to save the world, if you really want to change health care, um, supply chain is one of the best places to mm -hmm. do it. And so I think about, you know, if you look at studies about people coming out, I think it's Gen Z now that we're in, <laughs> but, you know, what really, what people want. But, you know, I am definitely not Gen Z. But I do. I want to save the world. I want to make a difference in healthcare, and that is why, as we, you know, with that very first question. And if you look at um, some of the leaders as well, I'll, I'll say, you know, whether you're thinking about going into healthcare, think about supply chain. You're thinking about supply chain, think about healthcare. Unfortunately, even though we manage the spend at the level of, you know, major multinational organizations, we don't pay like we're managing that kind of spend. But if you can really appeal to that, and then you can say there really is a career ladder. Um, Tim Cook came up, head of Apple, from supply chain. The head of Intel came up through supply chain. The head of General Motors came up through supply chain. Um, we've got leaders in this room who came up through supply chain and are leading major systems now. So, you know, there is a career path, but there's also an opportunity to make a difference. What are you crazy? <laughs> I didn't choose supply chain. Supply chain chose me, and I, I couldn't be happier. But I, lately, we've been interviewing for some roles and having those conversations, and a lot of applications coming from well-qualified people who don't seem to be running away from a job, but really looking for something more meaningful. And so that's a good place to start, right? It, uh, we may never pay like the the major companies, and maybe we shouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe. Maybe there's a, there's a sacrifice to be made in salary to work for charities. I know there is to work for charities. I know there is to work in certain professions because you believe, you lead with your heart to be a school teacher. I'm not saying you shouldn't get a fair compensation, but I don't know that the, if, if your first thought is, um, uh, I want to make a lot of money, that's, I would say to anybody, then you should choose healthcare supply chain. Um, and I mean that in all aspects. I know you could argue the vendor side or whatever side, <coughs> side you want to argue, but I, I often say, there is nothing more rewarding in supply chain. Mm -hmm. Other than the DOD, it's the only profession in supply chain that deals in life and death. Mm -hmm. And having been in the military, I prefer this version of it. Mm -hmm. But if you really, you literally want to make a difference, and you want to understand, some days the, the way you feel like you've made the biggest difference is nobody calls you. That's the reward, mm -hmm. that right? <laughs> nobody complained today, nobody worried about where their stuff was. That's the kind of reward you're looking for. You can, you, you should be recognized. You should recognize each other. You should appreciate each other, but you should do this because it's something you really care about yeah. and, and are willing to make those sacrifices. Because this isn't a job where you can necessarily guarantee you're going to have every weekend off. This isn't a job where I can guarantee you can work from home. This isn't a job where I can tell you it's going to be like the campus at Google or MSN. I haven't yet figured out how to push a box of uh, suture through a wire. So there's a certain physical aspect that will always be here to this job. <laughs> And there's a part that will make you nuts and crazy and insane, and you'll, and you'll feel like you're on treadmill doing the same thing over and over again, having the same arguments. But all you have to do is take a walk and talk to some patients, talk to the people who take care of the patients, be a patient, mm -hmm. and understand that you are, play a key role in that relationship. That's really good. Well, folks, I got, I got one more question, but I'd like to see if there's any questions from the audience. What did you tell that student, Nate? What I tell him? I told him he was crazy. <laughs> the question is what, what I tell that student. I, well, I, I, what I honestly said, though, was um, 
you know, the challenge of healthcare supply chain is really unlike any other, uh, if, from, from my perspective, obviously. And, and I, I do think that there's a lot of it was colored already of this panel, but um, the amount of stakeholders you have to work with really forces you to be a little bit sharper and, and be a lot more collaborative. And uh, so those were the, that, that sort of complexity and the, and the challenge of what I do day in, day out, and the fact that it's totally different every single day. You don't have any, any two days of the same in supply chain. Um, or, or, you know, I tried to sell the, the nicer sides of it. What I didn't tell them is that you're right. It's much better to be completely invisible in supply chain. If, if nobody calls you, you're doing your job. Well, or that, or if, if nobody's mad at you, you're not doing your job. And I should right? say that's so, one yeah. aspect of it, right? Yeah, but that's the basic <laughs> aspect of any supply chain. Things get where they need to be when they need to be there. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, you don't get to do anything else, that's right? right? And so that's there is that aspect to it. Yeah. But you should appreciate it because that's a big part of the job. It is. It is. Okay. Any questions from the audience? I got, I got one more, and then we can, uh, we can take a little quick break. So as you look at where you're at now and what you see coming out in the future, is there a, a company, a technology, or a person that makes you excited about the future of healthcare supply chain? You know, I got to say, I'm ex I am, um, I was surprised, but I'm excited about um, the appointment of Atul Gawande to run what I call the ABC company, the Amazon, yeah. Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, just having read every single book he's ever written. Um, you know, very, very, and he thinks bigger. You know, it, it was, I don't know if you, if folks remember the article he did on the Cheesecake Factory mm -hmm. and kind of looking at that and how do you apply that to healthcare and standardized processes. Now, he may have been looking at it more from a clinical perspective, but you can apply absolutely the same thing uh, to supply chain processes. So I think that and then from a thing, um, really being able to bridge the cloud, um, having to have everything on premise, not having to, everybody has to do the same thing. Um, and so the theme of the next generation ERP and just other things where we can, we don't have to store site being able to, that has been around a long time, but I don't think we've leveraged it fully. I'm excited about a lot of it. It's, it feels like in the last five, ten years there's been a real appreciation for uh, what is needed to really make a supp the supply chain as effective as it can be. I don't mean just moving boxes, I mean the ability to do an analytic partner with folks. I, you know, I was around the dot-com phase of healthcare where a lot of bubbles burst. There were a few technologies that lasted. I never got excited about it, to be honest with you. I didn't think we were ready for it. And I told a lot of folks that. Um, I said, I'm sorry, it sounds really cool, but I don't think we're going to do it. Uh, and I, it, it took a long time for those to materialize that we thought we'd have 15, 20 years. They're finally starting to materialize. And I think that has a lot to do with a different level of acceptance. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I wonder if there should be an iteration data on experience. I think when we, we got to be real careful, those of us in this room who have been doing this a while, it's okay to share the stories, but make sure we don't shut people down. Because this technology and the things that are happening right now, people are able to do things we thought we'd never be able to do. Yeah. We got to be careful we don't say, don't do that, because it didn't work for me 15, 20 years ago. The technology is such now, the opportunities are such now that we can do lots of things. So while it's okay to tell this, to share the stories, make sure we don't diminish people's enthusiasm to try something we may have failed at before. Because I think right now is the most exciting time I, in the 30 years, at least, I've been involved, that I've seen some real opportunity for real positive change and, and integration of people, process, technology, because it's going to take all three. Can I make one additional yeah. comment? When you talk about analytics, I think the other thing that's just really important is I'm very excited about things like artificial intelligence right. Right. and machine learning. But we have to keep coming back to and remembering the fundamentals. <clears throat> because, for example, if we are not actually capturing the fact that we use this, particular product in this particular procedure, and there's myriad of other things beyond just supply chain, but if we're not capturing the basic data, mm -hmm. you can't do artificial intelligence. Um, you can do bad intelligence. <laughs> so, so I think what's exciting for me is not maybe one particular technology or pro a program that's, that's, that I've seen in the last two years, but I think it's a greater effect. I think it's the deeper integration of what the technologies are bringing to us as it relates to the clinical care coordination and then the requirements around those aspects of business. And, and, and what I get excited about is that I think there's a deeper recognition and appreciation from the teams that are working around the issues. So personas are now being based on a much different profile of opportunities that relates to coordination of care and supply chain ex expertise now has central seat in those discussions. So what I get excited about is not the technologies as much, but it's the acceleration of the of the uh, the knowledge around that and the teams that are now using that at different levels and greater depth as it relates to the quality care that we're delivering. That's what excites me. Uh, uh.
today and uh, what's coming in the future. Right. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank the panel. Mm -hmm. right. You all give me a round of applause. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll take a, a five minute break and we'll come back in for the second session. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming, sticking around for the second panel. Uh, today, the, the second panel is really covering the topic of what the impact on the supply chain will be um, as payers and uh, providers continue to converge. Um, the panel today is comprised of uh, Brent Johnson, who most of you know from Inner Mountain, had lots of experience outside the industry. Um, Brent uh, really helped transform the Inner Mountain uh, supply chain and created a lot of leaders subsequent to that, so a very well respected, well admired uh, gentleman. We got Pam Daigle with Premier. She's the uh, Vice President of Strategic Sourcing. I'm really excited to be able to do a panel with her today because I get to pick on her for once. She's usually trying to draw information out of me, That's and now I get to draw stop. information out of her. So yeah, This panel will not change that dynamic. I don't know. I don't know about that. None of my information is reliable. And then at the end is Vance Moore, who is the president of business integration at Mercy Virtual. Um, he spent a lot of time with Mercy ROI, and again, a very well-respected uh, supply chain leader uh, in the industry. So. Uh, with that, I'm just going to hop right into it. This is a bit of a thought experiment because I don't think that any of us fully know what the impact's going to be on the supply chain and the way we, the way providers and suppliers work together as we, as we, as payers and providers converge. But just to kind of set the table a little bit, I think many of you are probably familiar with the um, prevalence of of direct-to-employer strategies that healthcare systems are, are um, starting to pivot towards. Um, obviously, accountable care organizations uh, change the way we do business and the way um, the way providers are paid, so the movement from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. I'll say even at our organization, we have a, a joint venture with a, with a large insurer for a direct-to-employer strategy, um, in, in addition to looking at, our, uh, looking at our populations that we serve a little differently. So more and more, we're not talking about patients anymore, we're talking about consumers. And you know, we're, we're pretty sure as an organization, even at Texas Health, that um, as, as, as we change over the next 10 years, the pricing transparency for services is going to be a lot higher than it has been in the past. Uh, the focus on wellness is going to be greater. And so because of that, we're going to be looking at our, our, our patients differently, we're, and we not even call them patients anymore. So all that has an impact on how we do business. And then you look at something like uh, an Optum uh, or a, a United Healthcare buying an Optum, you see insurers start to move into the actual provider space. So providers have a new set of competitors that they weren't used to having in the past. And then, of course, uh, Karen kind of hit on this uh, the last session. You know, with the, there, there's some really interesting movements made by folks from outside the industry altogether, like Amazon Berkshire and, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. So we'll be we'll be really curious to see how, how all that impacts um, how how the impacts of the industry at large, but also the supply chain in particular. So, so my first uh, question to the panel after that, hopefully, brief enough preamble. So, what does this all mean? Is anything going to change? Is everything going to change? What, what are you guys? What's your What's your first impression of what this means for the industry, and then also what it means for the supply chain? Rock, scissors, paper. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and panelists, make sure you get close enough to the microphone. <laughs> well, I'll jump in first then, and uh, so I think I think everything does change, but it's going to take a long time or a longer time to to get it done. And um, primarily because I think we built and continue to run um, an unsustainable model and with misaligned incentives. And uh, having been to the uh, emergency room in the last 30 days um, and seen a $11,000 bill come through uh, for, quite frankly, not a whole lot, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of reinforced the, uh, uh, one of the problems that we have out there. And so um, I, I, I personally believe it does all change, and if we don't change it, it will be changed for us. There's a lot of folks out there. In fact, uh, uh, just this past week, we had uh, the Mercy Board meeting, and Ken Kaufman spoke to us. If you haven't heard Ken kind of uh, turn your life upside down, you should do that. Uh, because he basically, you know, um, highlighted some of the things like uh, Ascension Health, one of our largest uh, health systems in America, is still just one-tenth the size of an Amazon or something like that. So people who are getting into our space, even our largest, is just a, a, a BB in the world of people who are, are probably going to shake us up a little bit. I guess we'll go down the line. I, I would agree with Vance. I think things absolutely are going to change. I think they're already changing. We are hearing much more about value-based care in the last couple of years. 
technology is growing by leaps and bounds. I actually think that's where supply chain is going. You're gonna be a technology expert. You're gonna be an analytics expert. You're gonna definitely be a relationship builder and far, far more integration into the quality side of the house to be more of a, I almost see it as a connector as opposed to a standalone um, individual or department. Notice she went to Van, uh, Vance's microphone and not mine. But <laughs> I'll go this way next. <laughs> no, I think we had, we had our own health insurance company at Intermountain Healthcare, Select Health, for the last 25 years. And I saw some benefit, but I think where the industry's going is even greater integration. Uh, we had benefit with communication, with coordination, with a better patient experience, trying to talk about reducing, you know, the cost for the patient. And Intermountain has the reputation of being one of the lowest, lowest cost of uh, healthcare in, in the United States. And so I think that having an insurance company at our side helped us. But where I see everybody's going, insurance companies care about cost, right? But they don't have a very good patient experience, they don't give treatment, they so forth. Hospitals, while you know ARM had the old thing CQO, we cared about cost, quality, and outcomes. Nah, hospitals, they don't know how to run a business. They don't really know how to reduce costs. They still build redundant everything in every hospital and in every hospital system. And so the two merging, though, is going to provide a better patient experience. But what it's going to do to the hospitals and to us as supply chain folks, having a pair next to us, it's going to bring cost pressures like we've never felt before. But a supply chain executives, supply chain leaders, it's going to provide us the burning platforms we've been wanting for years, you know? We will, even though we reduced a lot of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of costs off the bottom line of Intermountain Healthcare, we could have still done more. But they, you know, even though they treated us well and we were well recognized, they said, thank you, go back where you belong. We'll let you know when we need you next. This is going to raise the need to continue to do all the things we do well as supply chain executives and more to help reduce costs. So Vance, you kind of mentioned that you, know, you think it'll be slow going. Um, obviously, uh, we know the change is coming. Um, have, have any of you really seen any change so far with suppliers? I, I know for me particularly, there every on occasion I'll have a supplier come in and say, let's do a risk share arrangement on a quality measure of some kind. And and to be completely honest, it's a little tough to do that because get whatever given the product category, it's kind of tough to tease out causality, you know, whether or not that's um, whether or not a, a particular device reduces length of stay or what that actually means for us. But um, and and I, I do think that change is inevitable. Um, but are you already seeing signs, or is any of you seeing any signs of, of the supplier community kind of taking notice? that cost containment is going to be a little bit different now than it was, say, when the DRGs were instituted. Yeah. Um, so I would say marketing is still beating science right now, but I still have the desire and the I have the hope that science will beat marketing in the future. So it's, but, but at least the conversation is beginning. And I, and I think that, that all healthcare providers, as well as uh, I would say that the vendor and, and trading partner community has got to be satisfied with a larger piece of a shrinking pie. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the future, we're gonna get away from save me a nickel and what we're gonna to move to is the save me the entire device. Uh, there's two things that, that we're focused on tremendously, and we've been focused on it for a while, but it takes a long time for us to, to get there, is there's two important things, being effective and being efficient. And from an effectiveness standpoint, I really break that down into two areas, being uh, necessary and appropriate. So, you know, if it's necessary or not, because a lot of things we do is unnecessary, but if we can get rid of the unnecessary pieces and then focus on the necessary, then we have to say within this, yes, we need this device or whatever, but what's the appropriate mm -hmm. uh, within that necessary element? And that will lead you to more effective outcomes. And somebody said it, or the information, I think, is the, is the currency of change in the future and our ability to make objective decisions in the future. And that will lead us to making the right decisions on products. And I think that's one of the things we have to have conversations with the trading uh, partner community on. Look, if, if you're making marketing claims on your products today, 
you better be able to back it up with outcomes. And if you can't, then we need to have a discussion because one of two things happen. I'll pay a premium price for a premium outcome, but I won't if it's not. Mm -hmm. But it may be me. I'm using the product improperly or I'm using it on the wrong, wrong patient population. So I think we're going to find the relationships with trading partners get a lot closer. And to, to you know what Pam said, we're gonna we're definitely will get more on the from an integrated perspective on decision making. So I'll jump in, and now I have to use the left mic. So Brent, <laughs> that's right. Just make sure. Move to Thank it. you, yeah, sir. <laughs> I, she just I thought I was assuming she knew my attitude about GPOs, and so that's why she didn't <laughs> want to use my mic. <laughs> That was painful. That was a little bit painful, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Hey, I was ahead of I was ahead of a GPO once. <laughs> <laughs> now you've made me forget the question. Oh, okay. Here we go. Value based. I um I will say we have spent. There's a couple of things I want to highlight here. We've spent the last 14, 15 months really going deep on what does that look like. What does a value based risk share risk shift whatever agreement really look like and. Candidly, a lot of it has been, um, we're going to call it creative marketing. Uh, I would say that we've seen as many that really aren't a true value-based opportunity, but are just an if you will pay this, then you will get that kind of outcome. We really, really, really are wedded to this notion of that third-party validated evidence. If it's with our members, if it's outside, whatever that is, we really need to test the evidence. Don't, you know, don't bring it forward if you don't already have that. And I think the other thing I would say is um, the challenge is scale for us. We are really trying to figure out how do you scale that model in an appreciable way because many of them tend to be, for this organization, it's this. For that organization, perhaps it's that. And, and I don't mean by hospital, but maybe by IDN or by system, right? We have, um, we've had some great successes, but they take too long because of the customization of each one. I don't want to take an opportunity to an organization that doesn't have an issue with a particular practice or protocol. So we kind of do this matching, if you will, of here are, here are, here are outliers where there might be some opportunity for improvement. Here are suppliers who have brought forward something that makes sense. Let's figure out how we can work together. But even doing that, it takes time, and I just don't know how much time we have as an industry to go slow. We just can't do that anymore. I agree with everything you said. <gasps> and I'm from a GPO. Yeah, anyway. No, it was good. Uh, just two other thoughts. One is, you know, we're, we're headed into every one of these joint partnerships are about value-based partnering, about bundled payments, about, you know, pay for performance. And so it's the cost pressures that's going to come because of them. Two things, one bad, one good. The bad things, anytime we continue to have cost pressures, we're still going to come back to suppliers and ask for more, which is, you know, that's too bad because you've given a lot. The good news, though, is that for the first time, we really might have decision makers behind our back that want to listen to good risk-sharing opportunities. True. I mean, I've had suppliers come to me and say, if you'd ever listened to me, I could save you a million bucks. And, you know, maybe in these days might be a good time to listen to that or before you never had to. And before, I could only listen to things if my doctors agreed, if, every, you know. Mm -hmm. And now they may not be the final decision maker now. The payer might be. And if it improves the care experience or reduces costs, I think it's going to have a window of opportunity. So a couple comments that Pam and Brent just made that I think um, are a good jump off point is that we, we can't afford to tarry any longer really on this, right? But I think most suppliers and providers in, in the room would probably say that, you know, I'm gonna do what I'm, what I'm incentivized to do. And, and doing some of the unique relationships and cost containment measures with suppliers and, and unique collaborations are, aren't necessarily, um, the, the boat isn't close enough to the dock yet to say that, hey, I, I'm still getting 80% of my, my revenue from fee-for-service as opposed to, to value-based care. So, so what do you say to the provider or the supplier that says, I'll, I'll kind of believe it when I see it or I'll believe it when the, when the payment, when, when the way I'm paid changes? And, and what, so what would you say, it's really two parts. What would you say to a person that's gonna say something like that and then, and then 
know, what, what would you suggest they start doing with their supplier partners and even within their department to think a little bit differently in and, and, and prep for the future before they really need to actually make the change? Because when they have to actually make the change, it might, not, it might be too late at that point, right? I'll jump in, and, and I would welcome um, you two to, to chime in, please. But I, I think for me, I'm going to go right back to where I, where I ended that last one. It really is about time. And if you go ahead now and start thinking about something beyond just the price of the product, what is the cost, what is the profitability, what is that? Look at the service line. Kind of get out of supply chain a little bit and look at the, the functionality, the profitability of a service line and think about extending, uh, I suggest, thinking about extending yourself to those leaders and figure out how to, how to sort of move forward in a more progressive way. You got to start somewhere. Um, find that sweet spot of opportunity where there really is an issue. Is it your collapse rates are too high? Is it, you know, is it pick line infection? What is it? And start just, start one and then move on. So to kind of Brent's point, start listening to people when they say, I can save yeah. you a million bucks if you'd only... Yeah. Fancy got something? Cool. Look like you want to say something? Yeah, well, um, so, and this has been several years ago, but one of the, one of the better things that we did is uh, with, a, with a trading partner that um, we knew had potential, just like um, uh, Brett was saying, and, but yet we had never done business with him for a while. And we signed, basically signed a non-destruction, mutual non-destruction clause uh -huh. that basically said, we're going to do something. And we're going to do something together, and then we're going to go back and look at this in, in six months. And if it works, great, we'll continue. But if it doesn't work, you know what, we're going to rip that up and write something new that will con to continue to propagate our relationship. And we've, you got to trust somebody. And I think that's the piece to where we've got to find ways to, to work with people. Um, and, and the people that we work with has got to bring the right people to the table. And so if we are truly talking about the quality of the products, it may or may not, forgive me guys, but it may not be the sales team. It may be the engineer, the, the scientist, the, 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 the clinician that we'll be sitting down with. And then we're the arbitrators of this relationship that happens out in front of us. The, something's gotta happen because first of all, fee for service is unsustainable. Second, Us old people, I'm now on Medicare. The country can afford Medicare for everybody that's retiring every day. And so it's going to bankrupt America eventually, so something's got to happen. And they understand that. That's one of the reasons why this is moving. However, welcome to healthcare. Healthcare moves very slowly. I, I retired two, over two years ago. I spent a year and a half living in Mexico with my wife, giving service for my church. I'm back. I expected big changes. <laughs> this year, I'm just doing a little consulting, but went to Federation, went to SMI, went to the IDN Summit twice, you know, I'm here, and I listen, and, you know, what's changed? Welcome, you know, to healthcare. And, and part of it is that we're so ingrained in what we've always done in giving care, so focused on the patient, not cost. We don't know how to care for the cost. When Intermountain started five years ago to say, okay, we're going all in on population health, at least on a proportion of it. Our hospital CEOs, you get them to start thinking that it's good to have empty beds, and they don't know how to think that. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know how to think, keep them in their homes, we're going to reduce costs by keeping people healthy out of the hospital. That's a tough thing. I don't know very many, even our hospital administrators, that ever understood what that meant to be not have not to have beds because they got reimbursed for so long for yeah. to have full beds. Yeah, absolutely. So that's some of the changes in the culture of healthcare. Yeah, and, and kind of along those lines, I mean, the number one employer of doctors today is United. Yeah. And so you know when we start talking about a lot of people, you know, when the topic comes up of of payer provider relationships, I think I think we as asset heavy providers have great risk, and. Uh, because if you get the payers uh, aligning with physicians and they're uh, managing utilization, then they're working right down the path that, that Brent was just talking about. The goal will be to keep them out of, out of beds. And, and you know, I've, uh, over the last couple of years uh, that I've been a part of leading Mercy Virtual, we can, without a doubt, the highest, most critical uh, uh, chronic patients, we can reduce utilization by 50%. They end up staying, spending a lot more time at home, a lot better than they would being in a, 
uh, hospital where there are sick people. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're just not set up to succeed as we are today. So the world will change. Once again, it's a matter of when. And I think it is going to be when you start, when executives stop making money doing the things that we have been doing and start making money doing things the other way. You know, I, many have heard me say this a million times. Um, all progress intersects the wallet. So when the wallet begins to be impacted, we will see the change in not only leadership direction, but also uh, in, the, in the direction that we head. And I, I, I will that, say, oh, oh I'm sorry, Nick, yeah. I, I'm Nate, sorry. Um, and I think that, uh, I believe Karen talked about the Gen Zs, you know, the Gen Ys, the, even the Xs. We're in this, um, consumerism is taking more and more and more hold, right? So I think that too is going to play into this payer opportunity in a, in a much more meaningful way. Yeah, I, I think the other, so the, I don't know, again, for the providers in the room, like myself, we've definitely seen the shift from inpatient to outpatient, and that's kind of, that's kind of just the start of all this. But I, I am concerned, and it came up a couple times about the cultural cultural aspect of it, because you know there there is redundant capital. We, you know we want to, we want to do and 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 at every single entity, you're right? Every mm -hmm. single hospital, whether it makes sense to have an orthopedic service line there or not, right? Um, you, you've got to change the incentives for the hospital presidents, obviously. But the other thing, and I just want to throw this out to you guys too, um, you know, in, in in our in our future state, if if the patient's really going to be the chief stakeholder, or the or the consumer is going to be the chief stakeholder. Um, in our health system and the person that we serve, who does that displace? It displaces the physician. And so do you guys have any thought around uh, getting the physician? Because right now, I, I would make the argument that in many health systems, the physician's kind of the, the, the physician's a true customer because they, they control the volume in a lot of ways. And, and at least that, whether it's a perception or reality, that's, that's definitely the way we behave at times. And so what are your thoughts on trying to get the physician to be engaged as a part of the health system in a much different way than they have been in the past and to put that consumer, that patient at the center of, of decisions that we make? I didn't give him this question ahead of time, so. Oh, did you give us questions? <laughs> I, I just, heard one of them. I just <laughs> opened my mouth and talk. I don't know. Hey, no, I think the answer to that likely is what Vance said. Mm -hmm. All decisions run through the wallet. wallet. And so you have to give, you have to change the culture of the physicians by impacting their wallets. And I can, only, I can only speak to Mercy on this, but we have a work RVU-based system for physicians today. So to that point, it's basically you make a widget, you get paid for a widget. And so it incents volume. And we are literally in the process, had a meeting, uh, two meetings last week, and, and have two more this week uh, on changing to some other form of, of compensation. Because I do, I, it truly, once you begin to do that. Now, I will tell you this, though. We're also trying to shift away from individual uh, because it's individual uh, work RVUs right now, and we've got to find some way to incent team-based care. Uh, we can't afford everything being done by a physician. It's got, and one of the things we found out in Mercy Virtual is, you know, we've probably got a, almost a 10 to 1 ratio of non-clinical to clinical personnel in virtual. And we have some of the best care being provided is by former uh, Southwest Airline flight attendants that work as care navigators that just love people and engage with them and provide them hope and, and uh, companionship over a virtual connection in a way that creates an entirely different form of community that doesn't exist today in a lot of the communities that we, we uh, deal with. So there are new models that are coming out that there, it's got to find some way to make it okay for a physician to endorse that and to participate in that. Uh, but that's going to be a big issue, I, I can assure you. That will be a, Now, the good news is they're not making enough doctors or nurses. So there, we need other models to actually fill in some of the blanks here. Um, but, but bottom line is it will require uh, a realignment of the wallet. Yeah, and I mean, part of it too is the, the work RV, adjusting a comp plan implies that you're, you're dealing with employed providers and there's still, yeah. you know, not, you're not going to be at 100% employment right. on providers more than like, not anytime soon anyway. So, right. Pam, right. what do you? No, I, I would just, I would echo what, uh, what Vance said in, in that regard as well. I think, um, you know, we, we saw a little bit of a shift with more of the employee-owned physicians, but it doesn't make that much difference. It, it, it really comes down to the organization and the culture of that organization. When they build it the way Vance is indicating, then it works. When it is, we just bought the dock, 
that's a different story. So I think we have to kind of think about it from that C-suite level, as, as um, Brent suggested. And when the, when the CEO is, and his team is comp differently, so are the physicians, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then there's a different, uh, different mindset. The other thing I would say, too, is as you move to telemedicine and as you move to um, some of these other continuum of care treatments, you know, the reality is in all of that, the patient still wants to be heard and touched and, and listened to. And I almost think some of this navigator aspect is a better high touch, high feel for some of those um, patients than a physician. Because a physician has, you know, this is my schedule today and this is how I'm comped and this is how it's working. But these navigators are, I think, sometimes the stickier opportunity for you to, to really be that provider of choice for your patient. Well, I've also seen more health, system, uh, more, more health systems move to, you know, NPS, yep. net promoter score type models and, and looking at it from, from that perspective than just their H caps. But again, yeah. your culture has to be ready to act That's on right. that information because if you don't really truly see the patient as your, as your, uh, as your uh, customer, you may not do what, what they're asking you to do. So right. let me pause real quick because we got some suppliers in the room, correct? Right? You raise your hands, are willing to raise your hands? Um, how are you guys looking at this, this change in reimbursement? Is anybody brave enough or, you know, uh, to, to make a comment or to ask a question that maybe we're not addressing up here right now? I, I say this in front of most panels. I, one, of the, one of the challenges we have on the supplier side is that even if we have those, those solutions for uh, hospital-acquired conditions, whatever they are, the supply chain folks, generally not the folks on the panel, but a lot of them don't get, have no incentive to really reduce costs. It's what did you spend last year? We have to spend yeah. less this year. Yeah. There's no tie, no connection with the clinical outcome, the, the, the ability to do that, whether it's risk share or not. And, and I guess our challenge is how do, you, uh, how do you connect with the right people without offending you know, the supply chain? Um, it's interesting. I, I just I was thinking about Joe's comment. His his wonderful day is when he doesn't get a phone call. My wonderful day is if I ever get a phone call back from a supply <laughs> chain person. And believe me, I, I we know a lot of people. And, and it's but I get it because they, I, I know how busy everybody is. But somehow we have to find a time. Uh, that's a general comment. The other thing uh, it, it occurs to me is, and this is uh, I'll just say. Generally, then it, it, it begs the question, should we be approaching insurance companies to, to tell a story as opposed to trying to go through the hospital? If they're going to drive the, the dollar, then maybe we're going to the wrong place. And I'm not saying we have a lot, a lot of different I, clients. So I think you know, that's one of the interesting things is if the evolution takes place to where they, meaning the payers are making supply chain decisions, then you're going to go sell to them. I think that was your billion dollar idea there, Ken. <laughs> no, but he does raise a good point, and, and it is a challenge for supply chain professionals, and you know, obviously myself included. We have to take more time to listen to solutions that are out there and try to understand them. And, and I think that's an age-old problem um, from a supplier dealing with the supply chain person is you're not the last, you're not the, you're not, you're not carrying the last mile of this thing, you know. And so, you know, I think as a profession, we owe it to, to our supplier community, and probably even more so to our organization. Uh, to, to really sit down and understand these solutions and where they fit, or where they, whether they do or don't, um, in, into, into our overall portfolio of contracts uh, to make sure that we're, we're doing what's right by the, by the health system and by the patient ultimately. So it's good. And I good don't point. think you can boil the ocean, right? I mean, you've got to have this way to figure out, thank you, Brent, where, what is that, what is that thing, you know, and maybe supply chain needs to, if you have something, is there an issue, yes or no? That means they've got to reach out and, you know, and, and connect with the quality folks or, or whatever the appropriate service line is, as I said earlier, because they're not all going to be a home run. And not everybody has the same issues and not everybody has the same concerns. So it's really about that matching the right initiative with the right organization, product. I, I just wanted to comment. Um, initially, my background was economics and I still tend to go that way. But it, it does bother me as I, I, for 40 some years, I've heard pretty much the same discussions at, at different conferences. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's about patient-focused care, it's you know, uh, value analysis, et cetera. But 
sometimes I think we're trying to reinvent the wheel where, yes, the wheel does need to be reinvented, but we can borrow some thoughts from some other healthcare economies. And um, I'm retired now, but prior to retiring, I was kind of the head of technology implementation at, for a, a hospitals. And the first thing I'd go when, if the neurosurgeons came to me and asked me about something, could you help us get this? What do you think? I'd go online and I'd Google European healthcare systems mm -hmm. and some of the best cost benefit analyses, and really that's what we're getting down to, whether you're saying patient focused care or value analysis, it's cost benefit. And the National Health System of Britain, which is in a whole lot of trouble right now, however, has some great cost benefit analysis of great uh, technologies, the innovation, et cetera. And I remember one just a couple of years ago, I can't remember what, what the technology was that this chief of neurosurgery had called me about. And so I went on, you know, first thing I checked was National Healthcare System of Britain. Sure enough, there's a complete cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. And it not only told me what price they were paying, which was always nice to know, you know, what was the real value to the corporation, not dependent upon what market they're selling to. But also, for this particular, it was a very expensive technology. They had mandated it for every pediatric patient with that particular problem. And why don't we look at some, you know, why are we always saying insurance companies this? If you're talking about payer-provider relationships, well, different degrees of socialized medicine in Europe have had that for years. And I think we ought to take a quicker, you know, a, a more deep look at it. European physicians make one-tenth what our physicians do. And they don't have no, no pride. Got another one over here? Authority. <laughs> yeah. start off. The dy dy excuse me. The dynamic has changed so much over the last five years, though, within uh, within healthcare. When we first started at NCI, it was really working with supply chain, trying to work out you know the economics of it, the product, the quality. Now, though, when we're getting involved with hospital administrators, it's two different messages. We get a message from the hospital administrator: you have to help me generate revenue, whatever that solution is. How can that generate revenue for us? Supply chain is still looking at uh, how can we more economically obtain this product, whether it's, it's uh, a service level of it or uh, the uh, dynamic of quality of it or whatever those, those dynamics are. So what we've had to do over the last five years is actually put all those bodies together. So we work with an ID and we're really working with hospital administration, the COO, supply chain, everybody to understand what that particular solution set is and how it really works. It's a dynamic change from what it's been over the last 30 years. Where we're seeing it. Yeah. Well, and I think I think Joe um, in the last section, you know, I, I can see supply chain be, being the broker of truth, and to that to that piece of of getting the right parties around the table to begin to start to make. Because yes, I got to tell you, we have a thing right now going on, um, Fig Gig and Sig Financial Improvement Group. How do we reduce the the cost of our operation today? Gig Growth Improvement Group. And then the SIG, the service improvement group. So we're focused in all these various areas, and sometimes those are in conflict with each other. So that's, uh, I mean, you're right. It is a different day, and I'd say most of us are still trying to figure that out. And we still, we, we've, con we've consolidated silos, but we still have silos. So my firm has worked with payers for about 30 years now, and we're the major source of evidence analysis in coverage determination. Coverage determination drives reimbursement. And um, we also work with providers, including providers that own health uh, payers. A curious finding is that often their payer entity, um, Intermountain was an example sometimes, not so much in recent years, but in the past, where the payer entity would make a non-coverage decision about a new emerging medical technology and the provider would invest in that technology anyway and begin to use it. So there's this disconnect between, even within the same organizational structure, the payer and the provider. I, I think what I've started to see with supply chain in the last 
five, six years in particular is, I think there's a sequence of events that we're experiencing. Um, and it's, it's in the right direction. It, it began with standardization. Let's select products that seem to provide the best value and let's standardize to those products. That would help also with clinical variation. Then we began to see um, that same systematic approach applied to new technology acquisition. Let's put in place a health technology assessment process. So first and foremost, we determine whether the clinical evidence actually supports this particular product as providing more benefit than other products. In other words, comparative effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing that begins to emerge, and this is where it really gets dicey, is appropriate utilization right. protocols. Um, and right. that's where I see us struggling right now. And that's what ties into excess volume. We can, we can take a bundled payment, we can standardize the products that are used in that bundled payment, but if we don't get a handle on whether the patient needs that procedure in the first place, is that really the most effective? We haven't, we haven't really begun to address the overutilization of healthcare services, the of compulsion to have every bed filled, the compulsion uh, to do more and more and more. That's what's really hard. I don't have an answer for that unless we get everybody willing to make a cultural change. And if that change has happened, happens, we're going to have to constrict the healthcare delivery system in certain areas. We're probably overbedded. Um, we are probably over, um, we have too many uh, of certain technologies. And to get the return on investment, we have to overutilize them. There's things like that that have to go on, and I think supply chain is in a beautiful position mm -hmm. to step back and make sure that that kind of research, that kind of analysis in the context of the population served and the incidence and prevalence of different kinds of things that the population experiences is really going to be critical. But, um, but I think this pattern of ACOs and, and provider-owned uh, payers is a good one because you're going to start seeing this collaboration and this understanding, but it's got to involve physicians in that process or we're doomed because they're the ones that order care. Yeah, one of, uh, to that point, one of the things we have to be very careful of is the window of decision making because if we're comparing widget to widget, it's really easy just to focus on price and not look at, um, and in fact, I've had to apologize for phys to physicians before for hammering them on, why are you using this particular product? It's more expensive, you're different than everybody else. But when we looked at it from a care path perspective, it was actually lower cost overall, less re uh, readmission rates and things like that. So we have to take a much more holistic view of the entire care path in order to understand exactly what's going on. And I think that's one of the things that we failed in in the past is we were, we did our job, but we did our job very focused on saving a nickel on a widget instead of looking at holistically what is the, the, the outcome that we're really uh, targeting at the lowest possible cost. So. Let me, I'm gonna jump in real quick too because I, I, Winnie hits on a really good point and I, and I think the challenge for supply chain professionals in all stages of their careers will be to maintain that attention and the resources that we do have from, from, from Winnie's company around uh, uh, comparative effectiveness research and clinical research. But the thing is, is that the, the real um, challenge or the real uh, temptation is to get discouraged that you know that the changes that we could help make or the evidence that we could bring to bear and the data we could bring to bear isn't being heard by the right people and a lot of it is around the incentives I mean we, there there's off-label use bar all the time that are, that are purely related to a physician's practice and the health the health system is not quite in a spot yet to say no even if it isn't being reimbursed but the time will come where you know we have this we have this kind of keep keep going down the path we're going in terms of gathering the evidence and understanding it and presenting it to the people because eventually the timing will be right and uh, and and we'll be able to make ourselves valuable in that regard so um, Brent you got it somewhere? oh yeah Nick I'll, I'll launch it at you there you go <laughs> you 
to ask the panel, I just really want to leverage uh, Winnie's thoughts. You're right, because comparative effectiveness research and studies have been around for, for, for many, many, many years, right? Uh, but the problem is, obviously, that in adjusting the behaviors to be able to make the changes that are important based on the evidence of science that we have in front of us. So at some level, you're right, the behaviors are, are, are somewhat of our critical junction point. So I'd, I'd just like the panel to maybe to share any experiences as it relates to the governance modeling that has to change in the future to allow the coalition of individuals to be able to not only be better informed, but then how do you actually influence the narrative to make those decisions to move forward? Because it's not that we don't have the science, it's not that we don't have the research, it's not that we don't have the studies, we do. At many levels, it's determining how do we change behaviors within an organization that can really understand that information and make good decisions going forward. So at some level, it really comes down to governance modeling. How are we restructuring ourselves to have the right coalition of stakeholders in the right room to be able to make better decisions based on information that's, that's important to us? You know, the, the, the biggest problem, not the biggest problem, a big problem in healthcare is the demographics of healthcare. There's 6,000 hospitals. You take the 30 biggest systems, put them all in a bucket and you've got four or 500 hospitals, which means you got 5,500 hospitals. You got 80, 90% of the industry in small two, three, four, five hospital, and they can't invest in the supply chain. You may have a big system like Kaiser all of a sudden understanding incentives and driving their patients, but what do you do with the other 5,500 hospitals around the country? And I feel bad for suppliers because they can get ready to sell to Intermountain Healthcare or Texas Health Resources, but <laughs> you also have to get ready with to sell to everybody else that's still based upon costs. So I don't know how the entire healthcare industry is going to change. And at the same time, we have it, it takes 2,000 contracts to manage the basic stuff of, of providing healthcare. You know, from five, six hundred suppliers, and the biggest supplier we have. When I was, I spent 21 years in electric utility industry, head of supply chain for a fairly large electric utility. Our biggest supplier, you know, Westinghouse or GE, you know, made up 30, 35 percent of our, and so we could spend a lot of time partnering with them and driving out costs and identifying and sharing in the benefits. In healthcare, it's hard when you have your biggest supplier is probably a pharmaceutical distributor, and and you can't do a, you know, you just don't do a lot of partnering with that. You could, but you don't, and it's only four or five percent of your entire non-labor spend, and so. It's the dynamics of changing the industry. You got to understand the demographics of the industry. I don't have a solution. <laughs> so folks, we're kind of coming up on time, so I just want to ask the panel just for some some parting thoughts in the in just within the context of, you know, we do see a lot of change in the industry. We see the provider convergence becoming more clear, and we think that's going to, and we know it's going to change over time. But what good is going to come out of this? What, what, aspirationally, what are you excited about in seeing the shift in the market the way, the way we see it right now? I think for me it's going to be speed. I, I've hit on that a couple of times, but I think things are happening so fast now that, um, and I know fast in healthcare is still slow in most other industries, but I do feel like we're in a more progressive state than we've been before. I think technology has come an awful long way. I think when you see things like JP Morgan, Berkshire, Amazon, all of those things, um, and when you mentioned Atul Gawande, I thought, oh, yeah, those, those things are going to move the needle. Whether we like it or not, it's going to inspire the rest of us to make headway. And I think that's what we have to do. I just think there's a huge need for speed, and I don't think we're, uh, I don't think we can look back and, and slow down. So. I did want to mention the one thing about the innovation piece that we talked about, our governance, governance structure. I don't think any of us have the answer either, but the best practice I have seen is not when the CFO said, or the COO said, but it was the CMO, OO, FO together saying, this is what we're going to do. If we're all in agreement, now we're moving forward. So it's culture. Hmm. Well, I, fifty percent of all healthcare costs comes from five percent of the population. So if you take a look at it, it's a big pyramid. And that big pyramid, I think we, I think what we have going on are two different types of care that's taking place: transactional care, which uh, if you're, uh, I'd say, probably thirty-seven years and and younger, you don't even have a doctor anymore. You go to the the closest place you can get your your flu shot, your sniffle treated, whatever you need to have, have done, and it's a transactional uh, situation. 
as you get older, uh, you move up that permit uh, oftentimes. And when you hit about 57 years old, you all of a sudden start consuming health care at a disproportionate rate uh, as compared to any other uh, foreign markets. For whatever reason, that's when we really like to pump uh, health care into people. And so that's one of the things that we get into. I think that we have to be conscious of some of the social determinants of health. That will be an ingrow a growing importance of what we do because, you know, as we, as we treat patients today, we oftentimes think of them as a generic unit, and they're very different. Uh, I mean, if you have a, a person with chronic asthma and they live in a home that has no air conditioner and 30 cats, no matter what we do, we will continue to reprocess that person over and over and over until we can find a way to, to, to motivate that individual to change that behavior. And so that's something to where I think supply chain and, and the entire health system has to get their head around how can we influence people to make modifications in their, their, their situation. So the governance model is, I think, even a bigger question. It, it's not necessarily uh, just uh, CFO, and with all due respect, mm -hmm. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we're going to have to look at social workers and yeah. specialty councils and physicians and nurses coming together in a little bit different way and, and focus maybe not so much uh, on us, but on our patients and on our patient populations and think about those those five to eight critical uh, chronically ill uh, conditions and how we may have small nuances within those. And so with that being said, I think supply chain has also got to have uh, an appreciation that it's kind of, you know, Elvis has left the building. Uh, we've got to get out of our fixed-based uh, asset uh, environments and start thinking about how do we play roles in people's homes? Uh, are we going to be, are we going to have air conditioners? Uh, uh, on, on contract in the future. And instead of just delivering something to a floor, we're going to be not only delivering to a home, but also helping them set up their iWatch or whatever that may be in the future. I just think the supply chain has the opportunity to participate in, in such a dynamic world of the future if we accept that challenge, because somebody's going to do it. If we don't, somebody's going to do it. I mean, we see it every day when we see UPS, FedEx, or, or uh, Fred, the Uber driver, delivering my package from, from Amazon on Sunday. It's happening. That would have never happened five, ten years ago, but it's happening today. So somebody's going to do this. And so, once again, I hope we're brave enough to actually uh, kind of lean into that space. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. That's good. I, nice word to Brent. I, uh, I've been critical of health care and critical of, of a lot of things in health care, but I love working in health care. It's a wonderful, honorable uh, industry to work in, you know, because everything you do helps someone at the end of the row. The last 10 feet of the supply chain is a physician or a clinician with one of our products or tools in their hand giving care to someone who came to us. And so supply chain, the last panel talked about what are you going to tell someone, hey, there is so much need for supply chain, come and be part of us and, 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 and you'll use some of your tools, not all your tools, but eventually all your tools, but it's an honorable industry to be in. Now, back to your question, what do I think of all this? This is good. I have been critical of healthcare because there's so many walls that keep us from being able to do best practices of supply chain, delivering everything that we can to those who need us. And I think this is going to take down some of the walls. You know, it's too bad that this has to happen. We couldn't have decided it on our, on our own. So I think that it's good that it's going to open the opportunity for us to deliver more as supply chain professionals and suppliers. The real question is, <laughs> Do payers get so big that they make supply chain decisions? If they do, I've, you know, look out, you know. And, and you know, we were, how many were up at Amazon a month ago when the IDN Insights had their thing? And we heard from a couple Amazon executives. You know, what Chris Hold is doing with Amazon stuff is different than the JP Morgan Chase, JP Morgan Chase, because they're just going to figure out how to reduce costs for their million employees. They don't know their strategy yet. They're just going to spend a couple of years. But whatever they find is going to leak over in, into also some of this other strategy. But regardless, this is all good. I think it opens the door for suppliers and supply chain professionals to deliver more on what they're prepared to do. Well, Brent, Pam, Vance, thank you guys. Let's thank give them a round of applause. The recordings from the panel, the first panel and the second panel will be, will be posted on um, iTunes under the Bellwether Thought Leadership Podcast. So if you want to listen to all this again, uh, please, please do so there and uh, tell your friends. So thank you very much and hopefully see you at the reception.